conference for the California Council for the Social Studies. We're the largest professional organization of social studies educators, teachers, administrators, colleges and universities, publishers, nonprofits, all coming together to promote and support the teaching of the social studies for all young people starting in kindergarten so that they learn history, geography, economics, civics, and the humanities to be prepared to be responsible and engaged citizens. So we are just thrilled to have this forum uh, organized today. Uh, before we get started, boy, we, this was a lot of planning and a lot of work on this, and I just want to really recognize our organizing committee that consists of Drew Schlossberg and Matthew Hall from the San Diego Union Tribune. <laughs> Les Francis from the Campaign for the Civic Mission of Schools. <laughs> Joyce Curry from C3 Communications, Inc. And Spec Stacy Spector, the principal from Spector Strategies. So please join me in thanking this wonderful committee. Hundreds and hundreds of hours for months and months into reaching to this day, so we're very grateful. We're also extremely grateful to our wonderful partners and sponsors you see up here. We have McGraw Hill in the house. We have National Geographic Cengage, Pearson Learning, C3 Communications, the University of San Diego, Campaign for the Civic Mission of Schools, and of course, ABC 10 News that is live streaming for us today. We are so grateful to them. And of course, our good new best friends at the San Diego Union Tribune. So please join me in thanking all these wonderful sponsors. So now I have the distinct pleasure of turning you over to our wonderful moderator, the editor of the San Diego Union Tribune of the editorial section, Mr. Matthew Hall. Thank you, Matthew, so much. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and thank you all for joining us here today. I'm, I'm Matthew Hall, the editorial and opinion director of the San Diego Union Tribune. Uh, and on Twitter, I'm SD Uncovered. If you're uh, sharing, uh, the, uh, following along on Twitter, our hashtag today is uh, hashtag CAGOV. Uh, I'd like to thank first the uh, forum sponsor, the California Council on the Social Studies, for the Social Studies. Uh, and I know you thank all our sponsors, so I'm hoping you can get that out of your system, because when the debate starts, we're hoping that you hold your applause until the end to allow uh, uh, them to say as much as they can in the limited time that we have here today. We're being streamed live on ABC 10 News, on the websites of 10 News and S, uh, the San Diego Union Tribune. And we're actually streaming in multiple cities today. We're on ABC affiliates in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Fresno. Now, without further ado, let's meet the candidates who are joining us here today. Um, before we uh, meet our candidates, <laughs> uh, let me introduce the journalists first. Uh, on stage with me here today are ABC 10 News anchor, Lindsay Pena. Uh, Union Tribune Deputy Editorial and Opinion Editor, Chris Reed. And Union Tribune columnist, Michael Smolens. Uh, a quick word about the candidates who will not be joining us today. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom declined our invitation. He did that in January, saying he was too busy. State Treasurer John Chung accepted two months ago and then withdrew 10 days ago, citing an unspecified scheduling conflict. How we got the candidates on stage today, a quick word about that. They were invited based on criteria that included fundraising, prior service in public office, and their standing in independent, nonpartisan public opinion polls. Stacy, how are we doing? The reason why we're delaying is because Travis Allen is a couple minutes out. Um, This is what is known in the business as a pregnant pause. 
Thanks to you guys for all joining us here today. I know it's a Sunday morning. I know this is the last day of your conference, and a lot of you check out early. I also know it's Palm Sunday. Uh, so it means a lot that you're here fulfilling a civic duty. Uh, uh, it means a lot to uh, us here on the panel uh, and the candidates as well, I'm sure. Here, uh, Stacy. Okay, let's meet the candidates taking part today. They are, right on cue, Republican State Assemblyman Travis Allen. <laughs> Republican Business Executive John Cox. <laughs> Democratic former State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Delane Easton. and the Democratic former mayor of Los Angeles, Antonia Villagorosa. Well, good morning. You guys can all join us on stage. This could be a, a, a pretty easy debate, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> or a tough one, depending on I how do you look, look at. forward to being your next governor of the state of California. Here they come. By, by the way, while we're all here just waiting, this is my hometown of San Diego. I was born right here in San Diego, raised in uh, Chula Vista. Anybody from Chula Vista here? Anybody from San Diego here? There, there we, we go. go. Welcome Good to, to my town. Time. <laughs> Again, John Cox is joining us. John, we're, we're alphabetical, so you're next to Travis. Here comes Delaney Easton and Antonio Villagorosa. One more round of applause for the candidates. And again, I urge you as we get started here uh, uh, to hold your applause uh, and your boos, if there are any, uh, until the end, please. Uh, here are the rules now that the candidates have joined us on stage so everyone knows what to expect today. Candidates will get 45 seconds to answer a series of questions from our panelists and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if they are mentioned by name in anyone's initial answer. To help with the time, we have two folks in the front row who will hold up placards for 30 seconds remaining, 15 seconds remaining, and five seconds remaining, as well as to let you know when your time's up. Follow-up questions will be posed at my discretion, and will be if you guys don't answer the questions. The middle of our forum will feature something different, several lightning round questions posed by me with time for 30-second responses. After more questions from our journalists, candidates will each have 60 seconds for closing statements. Questions will be asked in ascending alphabetical order. Let's begin with our first question from Michael Smolens. Good morning and welcome to San Diego, to all of you. Um, gun violence, particularly at schools, seems to be on everybody's minds these days. Yesterday, the Parkland school shooting survivors uh, helped organize a demonstration that became a nationwide event. At gover as governor, what would you do to keep kids in school safe? First question is for you, Assemblyman Allen. Absolutely. Look, our, our kids have to be made safe. Uh, this, this means that schools being gun-free zones absolutely doesn't make any sense. The only people that they're gun-free zones for are the law-abiding citizens. The criminals that are coming on to our school campuses, this criminal child in, in Florida, the deputies went to his house 39 times. The FBI knew about him, yet law enforcement did nothing. There was actually a law enforcement deputy that was on site, armed, that did absolutely nothing. We cannot leave our children unprotected. It's important that our kids are safe and that we're all safe. We need to have people that are trained and have the ability to defend themselves and the children that are under their care while at our schools. Thank you. Mr. Cox. Uh, I have a 13-year-old daughter who's here today, and the thought that somebody would come into that school and, and hurt her would be horrendous. I asked the media when this happened to not publicize the names and the pictures of these monsters who do this. This is mental illness writ large and that we have got to do a better job. I could no longer think of uh, killing another human being. I mean that's a mental illness. It distracts us from doing the things we need to do. 
Travis is right. Going after law-abiding citizens is not the answer. What we need to do is we need to treat mental illness. We need to make it so that these monsters do not get the fame that they seek, and we need to get solutions that actually solve the problem. That's what a businessman does. Thank you, Ms. Easton. Mark Twain said the problem with common sense is it's not very common. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely true that nobody in America who's not in the military should have an assault weapon. I am proud to say that I voted for the assault weapon ban. The first one in America was here in California, and I was in the legislature at that time, and I voted for it. It's ridiculous that you should be able to turn a, a gun into a machine gun. It's ridiculous that you would have banana clips. NRA guy came into my office and said, well, you've got to have banana clips. We have elderly people that go hunting. You, it's illegal to go hunting with a clip with more than five bullets in it. So let's not let people pull the wool over our eyes. Stick with the common sense solution. Let's get rid of assault weapons in America. Please hold your applause again. Thank you, Mayor. In 1999, I authored the toughest assault weapons ban in the nation. Uh, all of the uh, package of gun responsible gun legislation in the 90s was passed under my speakership. I think we need universal background checks, a very strong universal background check. We need to get assault weapons out of the hands uh, of people. Uh, I don't believe you have a Second Amendment right to a bazooka or to an assault weapon. Uh, and we need to get uh, address straw purchasers, legal, people who can legally buy guns on behalf of others. Thank you. Uh, next question by Lindsay. Good morning, everyone. Candidates. Like many other institutions, Sacramento has a problem with sexual harassment. In this Me Too era, where is the line between boorish behavior? and conduct that should get someone ousted from the state capitol. Mr. Cox, we'll start with you. You know, I'm the son of a working mom, and the idea that someone would take advantage of their position and hurt my mother and her position is abhorrent. I led the recall of Bob Filner, and that was my gift to the people of San Diego. What we need to make sure is that leaders lead and don't t engage in risky behavior. The sexual harassment cases in the legislature were horrendous, as well as the sexual uh, proclivities and the sexual indiscretions by two of the candidates in this race who were leaders of mayors of major cities and engaged in risky behavior that, in, that exposed them to extortion and blackmail. That's a real problem. We need to have le legislators and mayors and leaders who engage in proper activities while they're serving the people. A quick follow-up. So where is the line? Uh, I think you should conduct yourself uh, in a proper fashion and as, as uh, someone who respects others' zones of uh, privacy. Uh, I think that's, that's a good place to start. Thank you. Ms. Easton. Well, of course, you should do that, but the problem is people aren't doing that. Yep. They're crossing the line in the public sector and in the private sector. Time's up. It is time to, in fact, draw the line very clearly in the sand and say from now on we're never going to use another public dime to buy the silence of somebody who's been sexually harassed. And anybody, whether in the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, needs to, in fact, show better leadership. And that means electing more women to positions of authority in this state and in our country and putting them on boards and putting them on commissions and having them be present because at the end of the day, it is absolutely unacceptable that women would be harassed. And every woman in this room and most of the men know it's still going on in this state and it's disgraceful. Thank you. Mayor? Yeah, you, Mayor. I stand with the Me Too movement. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, I uh, enforced our nation's uh, civil rights laws. Uh, I was an uh, investigator investigating sexual harassment claims, uh, sex discrimination, race. Uh, I, I do stand with the notion that we, uh, I th think it's the labor bill that says uh, that whistleblowers uh, ought to be protected. Uh, I think that uh, these investigations, both in the legislature or in the Congress, need to be conducted independently of the legislature, and people need to be held accountable for the actions. Where's the line? I think the line is where a woman draws it, where she says, no, it's unacceptable. Uh, I don't uh, believe that... Uh, a term and condition of my employment uh, is that you harass me. Thank you. Assemblyman? 
You take a look, you have four candidates standing before you in the race for governor. There is one who is conspicuously absent. Gavin Newsom is not here this morning. Gavin Newsom was guilty, admittedly, of sleeping with his best friend's wife. Think about this. While he was mayor of the city of San Francisco. If we can't trust Gavin Newsom with his best friend's wife, how can we trust him with our state? And also standing on the stage is another former mayor, Antonio Viragosa, former mayor of Los Angeles, also guilty of sexual indiscretions. I will tell you right now, the line is very clear. The line is where it's abusive. The line in the California legislature, we have not even begun to see it yet. There are cases that they have not yet released. By the way, I did bring 600 people down here to San Diego, your town, to replace Bob Filner. Thank you, Assemblyman. He was guilty of sexually harassing over 20, different women. Thank you, Assemblyman. That's where the line is. Mayor, you were named. 30 seconds for rebuttal. You know, I made a mistake in my mar marriage, and I paid for it. Uh, I lost my family, and I lost the trust of the people of my town. Uh, thankfully, uh, I've regained uh, the trust of my family. And I think over time, uh, the rega I regained the trust of the constituents in my town uh, because I was focused on them and not me. Thank you. Next question by Chris Reed. Governor Jerry Brown famously a few years ago derided the whole idea of education reform as a siren song, suggesting that California and other states don't really know specific ways to improve their schools. Yet union-friendly states in New Jersey and in uh, Massachusetts and in New York State have achieved significantly better test results across ethnic groups uh, by adopting reforms that they find to be very effective. Should California emulate these states? Which states and which reforms? Well, one of the things you all should know is that it's interesting they picked those three states, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, is spending more than twice as much per child as California is spending. Hello? The elephant in the room, we got a bunch of educators here. You know, we used to be tied with New York, fifth of the 50 states in per-pupil spending. Today, we're 41st of the 50 states. You're living in the most expensive state in the union with the highest number and percentage of poor kids and the highest number and percentage of English learners. Of course, we should be investing more. And we do know what we need to do. We have some fabulous schools in this state, but they tend to be the schools in the more affluent areas where the kids have enough resources and the teachers feel supported, and we don't have class sizes that are just skyrocketing again. So it's common sense is not very common. That's what we need in California, an investment in our kids and their future. Uh, Ms. Easton, I didn't hear uh, specific reforms, and Chris has a follow-up. A follow-up question on that, Ms. Easton. The fact is, is that Florida and Texas spend far less than California and yet have better scores. So the idea that school quality is a function of school spending, where's the evidence of that? We're now 70 years into the modern system of public education in California, 60 years in. We have a, a long history of showing there is not a clear, obvious one-to-one -one connect between what we spend and the goals we achieve. So it seems it's 2018, it's not 1965. The argument that school quality is a function of school spending, where's the beef? Well, let me just tell you that in, in uh, Texas, they have hundreds more teachers than we do, thousands more teachers than we do, and they have fewer kids than we do. So the truth is the cost of living is much lower in Texas, and so a dollar goes a lot further. We must, in fact, look one another in the eye and say, when California was investing near the top, we were in achievement near the top. And I will go on to say that I do think there are other things we need to do. Preschool for all, mandatory kindergarten. We need to, though, reduce class sizes and make sure our kids have counselors, nurses, and librarians again. All of those were dead last in the 50 states and near the bottom in, per, in class size. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? You know, when I was mayor of Los Angeles, uh, one out of three schools were failing. Uh, we had a 44% graduation rate. Uh, by the time I left, uh, because we engaged in reform and set high standards, that one out of three schools was one out of ten. The 44% graduation rate was 72%. I do believe we need more money for our schools. But I think we also need to ask more uh, from our schools. The fact of the matter is, uh, I've, I was Speaker of the California State Assembly and Mayor of Los Angeles, and I can tell you this. I know taxpayers in this state. They want, they're willing to give us more if we're showing that we're doing more with the money we got. The, the gains that we made uh, in Los Angeles, we made when they were laying off teachers uh, to an extent that we hadn't seen in decades. And we were still able to make those strides. So, yes, I do agree we need more money, but we also need to do more with the money we got. Thank you. Assemblyman? California used to have the best schools in the nation. 
Now our schools are ranked among the worst, and some studies even show that our kids are 46th and 47th in the nation reading and math. Only 30% of our ninth graders are ever expected to finish a four-year college degree. We have to demand accountability once again in our schools. No longer should we have fifth graders reading at the second grade level. Children must be tested in the beginning of the year and in the end of the year to make sure that they actually have learned the requisite skills they need. Reading, writing, math. No more trophies for all children in California. You have to earn your education. Very simply, children must understand that this is an education that we earn in California. Parents must be given the choice to send their kids to the very best public schools or the various public charter schools or homeschool if that is the best option. We must put the children first in our education system. Thank you, Assemblyman. Mr. Cox? The politician's answer is all the same, spend more money. Jerry Brown has increased education spending by 80% since he's been in office, and the education results have gone nothing but down. Competition is the only way to get quality and efficiency. Every day I wake up in the private sector and I try to do something to beat my competition. Barack Obama and Bill Clinton had a choice of a good school, a good private school for their children. I think every parent has to have the power of choice, has to have the power to choose a competitive education, a, an efficient and quality education. Throwing more money at the same system, which is riddled with corruption and cronyism and controlled by the unions, is not the way to improve our education. Thank you. Our next question by Michael Smolens. I'd like to return to the issue of gun violence. Uh, in Sacramento, people have been protesting the recent police shooting of Stefan Clark, a young black man uh, who was unarmed uh, but carrying a cell phone in his grandmother's backyard. Uh, this is the latest incident of uh, skeptical or, or questions about police action, uh, particularly in shooting and minorities. As governor, what would you do to help skeptical Californians, and particularly people of color, have more faith in law enforcement? That's for you, Mayor. Well, first of all, uh, that was a tragic uh, situation. I think that uh, having been a mayor uh, over the years, I can tell you that the chief, Chief Hahn, is right. Uh, we have to have an investigation. It should be thorough and transparent. Uh, we have to gain the trust of the community, and particularly the African-American community in that sense. Uh, I do believe uh, that uh, we also have to understand uh, that law enforcement have a tough job. Uh, and in the spur of a moment, sometimes uh, these kinds of things happen. So we need to make sure that the, the investigation is transparent. I think we need better training. Uh, I think we also need to stand up for the proposition um, that our police force needs to look like the communities they serve. Uh, in Los Angeles, they Thank do. You, Mayor. Uh, and up. they do in no small part because I was focused on that. Assemblyman. Very simply, the man that was unfortunately shot in Sacramento, the reason that he was, the reason this whole thing happened is he was breaking into cars. He had smashed a couple of car windows because he was stealing from those cars, apparently. He was then chased by a helicopter, and he ran from the police. I'm not sure that investigation he, he has... breaking into cars. I'm what not sure that? that investigation has concluded. Excuse you? I'm not sure that investigation has concluded okay, to prove that he so was doing why, that. Why don't we reset my time? To the very best of my understanding, it's very clear... To, to the very best of my understanding, it is very clear that this individual is breaking into cars. When the no. police helicopter began to follow him, he then ran from police. When police finally apprehended him, he approached them with something in his hand. Listen, number one, this person should not have been breaking into cars, and number two, he should not have been running from the police. It had nothing to do with the color of his skin. There is no police officer that wakes up in the morning and wants to shoot someone. We must back the badge, respect our Time's law enforcement, up. And Time's understand up, that there are laws that are enforced by our police officers in California. Time's up. Mr. Cox. Nope. Uh, may I? Nope. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. My mom taught at an all-black school. I know how tough it is to live in that community and, and see the, the problems that exist every day. I also know how tough it is to be a police officer in those communities as well. And it's a very, very risky job. Uh, I see this as a tremendous tragedy and I also see it as a situation where we have to have a lot more training but I, I, I tell you you cannot expect to run from the police and where is the leadership here Mr. Newsom immediately pounced and said that if it was a if it was a white assailant he wouldn't have been shot well I'm sorry 
we got to ha stop having politicians who divide us on race. What we need to do is have leadership that says, let's respect the police, and then we'll get respect back. And if we have rogue police, we need to go after them and better train them. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Ms. Easton. Ladies and gentlemen, you as social science educators know that we have to stop criminalizing poverty, skin color, and mental health issues. That's a fact. The state of California needs to in, in, hold people innocent until proven guilty. The idea that you would execute a kid execute in his grandparents' innocence. backyard for, who's guilty only, of, of, so far as we know, of holding a telephone is absolutely outrageous. And so I say to each of you, it's time, yes, that we recruit a broader spectrum of people into our police services, but it's also time to look at some of the European countries that are getting a better result by not criminalizing every damn thing people do, and especially not treating children as if they were adults. I met a kid that was locked up when he was 16. He was in San Quentin. It's ridiculous. You're up, not, your Houston. brain's not developed when you're 16. Thank you. Uh, our next question by Lindsay Pena. All right, we're switching gears here and touching on immigration. It's no secret that the Trump administration and current California leadership seem to be at odds over this issue. How far should California push back against the Trump administration on immigration and at what cost? What do you see as the risk to such an adversarial relationship? And do you think the president would go so far as to withhold tax dollars or resources from California if that is the stance that we choose to take? Assemblyman, you start. So I'm actually the only candidate in the race for governor that voted for and supported and even wrote op-eds in favor of our Republican nominee for president, Donald J. Trump. Trump has the exact right idea, which is enforce the rule of law in the U.S. Constitution of the United States. It is very clear that immigration is the sole, sole province of the federal government. And as your next governor, state of California, I will ensure that federal immigration law is enforced. Last year in the legislature, I introduced legislation to defund every sanctuary jurisdiction in California. This year, I will introduce legislation to reverse the illegal sanctuary state. And as your next governor in the first 100 days, I will ensure that this sanctuary state is reversed. By the way, go online to jointravisallen.com and sign the petition to have your city opt out of the illegal sanctuary state as Los Alamitos, California, in my district, just did. It's illegal. It endangers Californians. Thank you, Assemblyman. And we won't have it in California. Mr. Cox, your turn. Uh, Border security shouldn't be controversial, uh, nor should it be controversial for authorities, law enforcement authorities, to work together. But i got to tell you, this is classic politician speak, because what they're doing is they're distracting you. They're creating all this war with Washington, D.C., so that you don't notice the horrendous cost of living in this state, the lack of opportunity in this state, the trillion-dollar unfunded pension debt they created. <laughs> They've created conditions in this state that are making it impossible for the working class and the middle class to live. And then they throw these sanctuary state things at us. They appoint undocumented immigrants to state posts just to stick a finger in the eye of people and to distract us from the messes the politicians are creating. Let's get solutions to problems. That's what I'm about. Thank you. Ms. Easton. For many years, I taught political science, and I watched with great interest as Republicans all over the South waved the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution in our face as an excuse to discriminate against people of color. They said, a law is not given to the federal government nor denied to the states should be the property of the states and the people. It is so ironic that a thug like Jeff Sessions, who defended such horrible color discrimination in his area should be allowed to stand up and say we ought to follow the Constitution. Immigrants are the most entrepreneurial, risk-taking, and, and, you know, also are who is in this audience today. Don't look now. You're all descended from immigrants. So, in fact, I support our sanctuary state status, and I support the sanctuary cities, and I stand with our immigrants as law-abiding neighbors and friends. A thought. A follow-up, please. So what would the risk be to that adversarial relationship, and, and uh, are you worried about the withholding of tax dollars? Am I, am I worried about what? Do you worry that the president will withhold tax dollars from California? What is the risk to that adversarial relationship? 
I think for the same reason that Jeff Sessions and the other segregationists went to court against the federal government when they thought their rights were being impringed on, we should be prepared to do that in this state. And I think both of the major candidates for attorney general are with me on this, that we will stand up for the people of California and for our federal money. You should also know that, in fact, we are a net donor to the federal government. We only get 80 cents back on every dollar we send. So for him to threaten us with taking money away, you know, it just is embarrassing. And it's not America. It's not the America I know and love. And it's something we've been working to change for a long time. States' rights have a place in the Constitution, and we should use them to protect our neighbors. Thank you. Mayor? I think it's pretty clear that we have a broken immigration system. Both the right and the left agree on that. And so they need to come together. The feds need to fix this broken immigration system. But until they do, uh, we have 11 million people uh, in this state who are working, uh, the vast majority of them. Uh, they're going to school. Uh, they're opening up businesses. They're buying homes. They're participating and contributing to our economy. Uh, California is the epicenter of that group of people. And uh, this California Values Act didn't start in Sacramento. It actually started in L.A. And it started in 1979 with a very conservative police chief. His name was Daryl Gates. He did it not because he was pro-immigration or against it. He did it because he was pro-public safety. He believed that you needed to engender trust in your community uh, among immigrants to make sure uh, that uh, they're cooperating with the police department. And so uh, with respect the risk to is, are you worried about the risk? Sure. We're all worried that they're going to uh, move ahead to take away our, uh, our money. But uh, I agree with Delane. Uh, there's a thing called the Tenth Amendment, and we're going to use it. And we're going to go into the courts and stand up for the proposition that this is our tax dollars, by the way. We're a donor state. We, we give more than we get back from the federal government. They ought to be giving us more, not less. And uh, le legislators or con congressional members on both sides of the aisle, aisle ought to be fighting for that. But uh, So, yes, we're worried, but we're going to court. Thank you. Uh, next question by Chris Reed. It's been 20 years since the California Bureau of Audit put its reports online. And if you pay attention to 20 years of reports, the record is stunning on how many state agencies continue to have the same problems they did in the late 1990s. Can you give us an example of a state agency that isn't well run, and what would you do to improve it? Uh, we're starting now with Mr. Cox. Uh, this is the equivalent of a hanging curveball. Uh, Caltrans, which spends four dollars and fifty cents for every dollar Texas spends on a mile of road. I mean, talk about waste, corruption, and inefficiency. Let's also talk about the high-speed rail. Anybody want to buy a high-speed rail? That's now twice the budget. It's enriched trial lawyers and environmental researchers, and has done nothing for the economy and will never get built because it'll be superseded by a lot of other things. And by the way, this is another agency, Chris, that has refused, the legislature has refused to audit the money that's being spent. I'm a CPA. I can't wait to get my hands on this budget and practice zero-based budgeting and look at every single dime that's going to be transparent to the people of this state. Thank you. The waste and inefficiency going on. Thank you. Ms. Easton? Some years ago when I was in the legislature, they had a bill that they were going to add 28 offices to the Department of Motor Vehicles and 28 new buildings. And I raised the question, why don't we just open the buildings we have on Saturday? That would serve the citizens of California as well as saving us a lot of money on new buildings. And I was told we tried that. It didn't work. And the reason, I, they sent me a report. It didn't work because, one, the, it, the employees hated it. Well, they were getting... Uh, told at 4 o'clock on a Friday that they had to work on Saturday. Two, it was too expensive. They paid time and a half, really. And three, I mean, I worked in the private sector, too, and if you offered overtime, people were begging for it. And three, too many people showed up. It was too successful. You can't make this stuff up. So there's a lot of those agencies. I think we can improve DMV, EDD. I think we can improve Caltrans. And I'm out of time. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, you're out of time. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Antonio. I, every time you say Mr. Mayor, for some reason, I'm um, not mayor anymore, but when I'm governor, you can call me Gov. Um, let me just say, I, I think that what's pretty clear from these audits is there's not just one agency. Look, uh, government can be run better. The state government, county, local government, uh, school districts. I, I agree with the proposition we need to do a better job. And I, I think what we need to do as soon as those audits come out is put them on the websites of those 
uh, uh, various agencies with a plan to address the audit uh, and hold managers accountable for, uh, you know, meeting the goals of uh, fixing what's broken in these agencies. I think streamlining our bureaucracies is something I would agree uh, needs to happen, and certainly as governor, I intend to do. Travis. California's system of unelected bureaucrats is completely out of control. There are more than 500 state agencies. Caltrans, as was mentioned a moment ago, their budget is over $13 billion. Yet in 2014, the Legislative Analyst's Office came out with a report saying they were wasting over $500 million a year on 3,500 employees that were entirely duplicative. In addition, you have agencies like the California Air Resources Board run by Mary Nichols. This agency originally did a lot of great work. We all love our clean air in California. But now it exists to regulate companies out of business in our state. The problem is, is that we have people like Nichols running these agencies. As your next governor of the state of California, I will ensure that Mary Nichols no longer has a job in the California government. We will clean up these agencies, reduce them in number and in scope, so we can actually build things again in California, keep our environment Thank clean, you, Assemblyman. but doing it without wasting your taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to our lightning round. Uh, so here we go. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Allen again. Uh, what si and you have 30 seconds for this as a reminder. What single curriculum change does California most need to implement? Get rid of Common Core. Absolutely, we must give the locals control over their education. The local districts must once again be in charge of what they're teaching our students. There must be accountability so they know, we all know that our students are getting reading, writing, and math, all the basic skills that we learned when we were in school. But Common Core is a failure. I have a nine-year-old daughter in California public schools. I can tell you right now, she is not learning the way that we learn, and the education has diminished in California. Locals must have control, which is why we need competition in charter schools as well as public schools and local choice. Mr. Cox. Uh, civics. Uh, I, I became a lawyer because uh, my seventh grade civics teacher and uh, my mom also taught. Uh, the trouble with California, by the way, is we're not teaching civics, but the kids don't want to learn it. And I got to tell you, the adults don't want to learn either. And the reason is because they know that their legislature and their government is controlled by special interests. I'm the only governor candidate who's talking about reforming the system to put the people back in charge. When the people are in charge, they will learn civics. They will turn out to vote. They will take an interest in their government. Ms. Easton. This isn't just education, right? You didn't ask about Curriculum education. change. It's education. Yes. He oh, it's school education. curriculum. Okay. Yes, please. Curriculum. Well, I mean, what, the biggest thing we've got to fix in education is we're underinvested, terribly underinvested. And we need to do a lot more to help our kids be in smaller class sizes so that they can, in fact, learn English, they can master civics, they can learn all the other things. But the truth is we need more teachers, and we need to treat teachers like they have the most important job in America because they do. And we need to treat educators as if they have a sacred trust with the state and its children. And if we do that, if we raise up the children and the education system, we will raise results as well as investing more. I didn't hear a curriculum change, though. Five seconds. Pardon? I didn't hear a curriculum change. Please, five seconds. What would your curriculum change be? Curriculum change. Curriculum change, I would, I would give children a longer school day and a longer school year so they have more time to learn everything they need to learn. Thank you. Antonio. I'm not sure that's a curriculum change, but I'm with you on that, 100%. Yeah. I think we do need to extend uh, the, the, the school year and the school day, particularly for kids who have been left behind. But if there was one curriculum change, I'd bring back the arts. You know, when I was a kid in the public school, you could, you could play the trumpet and, you know, for 25 cents, and if you couldn't afford it, uh, you, they'd give it to you for free. Uh, and I think that we need to bring back the arts because, as we know, not everybody focuses on science and math. Uh, we, uh, it's a great way to learn science and math, by the way, or social studies. And so I think the arts is a curriculum change that I would make. Thank you. Uh, second question, we'll start with uh, John Cox. Should teachers be allowed to get tenure after two years in a process that starts after 16 months as they do now? Sorry, I don't know why tenure is it even available to begin with. Uh, I'm in the private sector. I don't have tenure. I could be fired at any time. And you know what? It makes me better. We got to be able to get good teachers. I want to see teachers paid like rock stars and movie, uh, movie stars and baseball players because of merit, because of quality. And I've got to tell you, 
The tenure system shouldn't even exist, but the corruption and cronyism in Sacramento keeps it there. Talk to Shirley Weber, who's tried to extend uh, the probation period, and it's been Thank ground you. out in committee. Ms. Easton. The probation period is too short, in my opinion. And as somebody who set up the Teacher of the Year Foundation, I will tell you, I had a group of Teachers of the Year at my home, and we were... Uh, after an event, we, the national, the statewide teacher of the year event, they came by and we had a glass of wine together and every single one of them thought it was too short. The fact is we ought to have at least a three year requirement. You have to, you know, many of us do not, aren't ready for tenure after 18 months, which is essentially when they're getting it now. So I believe it ought to be a three year requirement and I stand by that. Thank you. Mayor Antonio Villagrosa. Antonio, <laughs> thank you. Mm. I, Getting, I'm, I'm so focused on governor that I'm forgetting I used to be mayor. Um, you know, I, I, I think right. teachers have a really tough job. You know, about 50% leave the profession in the first five years. Uh, I worked for the teachers union for eight years. I represented uh, many of those teachers. I do believe the tenure uh, track is too short. And I've come out in support of Vergara, as you know, uh, because... Uh, I did believe that it was too short. I think at least three years. I think there's some 30 states that have three years. Uh, it, it should be at least three years. Um, I, I think that we, we need to understand uh, that we have to focus a lot more on teacher training and teacher support. Uh, but we, de we do need to hold people accountable when they're not ready for Thank the profession. You. Travis Allen. Uh, very simply, the current tenure rule is ridiculous. Uh, even you take a look at progressive Democrats like Shirley Weber, as was mentioned a moment ago. She would like to extend tenure from at least three years, potentially even five years. And it does beg the question why we still have a tenure system in place at all. But the current tenure system, where it is only just a couple of years and then we have you know, tenure, it really it begs the question as to, to why we are granting this. In the end of the day, our education system should be for the benefit of our children first. We have to have excellent teachers, and we must reward those teachers. But I don't think the tenure system is effectively doing that as it's currently written. Thank you, Assemblyman. Uh, next question, to start with Delane Easton. Should CSU and UC have free tuition? Yes, absolutely, unequivocally. I went to UC Davis when it was $82.50 a semester. And it was still hard for a blue-collar family to send their kid because I had to live away from home. I had to buy the books. I had to have the spending money. It was still a stretch. But today we're making it almost impossible for young people to go to college. So I believe in tuition-free UC, CSU, and community colleges. And I have been vocal about it. If those people coming out of a depression and war could figure out how to do it for us, then we, by God, could figure out how to do it for the next generation, especially now when education is more important in the world than it's ever been before. Thank you. Antonio? Thank you. Um, should it be free? Yes. I think we'd all like it to be free. Uh, but we don't have the resources for that. So what I th have said, we've got to start with poor kids. Uh, my children don't need a free CSU or a UC. Uh, me, 50 years ago, did. So I believe that we should focus first on the kids uh, who have the talent, who want to, uh, and to go to UCs or, or CSUs, but can't afford it. Uh, and uh, with respect to Time's the up. rest of our kids, it should be affordable, and Thank it currently you. isn't. Thank you. Travis Allen. No, absolutely not. College should not be free. But what we should be doing is freezing the tuition at current levels. There never should have been a tuition increase when Janet DiPolitano was stashing away $175 million in a slush fund, and our kids had to pay higher tuition for it. Number one, Janet DiPolitano should be fired. As your next governor of state of California, I'll tell you, she will not be in her position. The next step is very simple. California's colleges should be for the benefit first and foremost for California's children. Our citizens should be put first in line for our schools. And yes, we do got to build a lot more CSU and UC campuses. This is our next generation. It's about time we Thank build you. it in California. Thank you. John Cox. There's nothing free. I worked my way through college. I went to a community college to begin with. I had a conversation just yesterday with an administrator at the UCSD who told me that she has to deal with 18 different bargaining units that represent faculty. And most of the faculty teaches one course. That is unsustainable. You've got to be able to have affordable education, and you've got to have a reasonable payroll system that allows the cost to be spread among people. We also have to address the housing crisis, which is also addressing uh, increasing the cost of salaries in our school system you, and all across government. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, our next question to start with uh, Antonio Villagrosa. Good segue. Governor Jerry Brown and Janet Napolitano have feuded over UC funding. How would you change that relationship? Well, uh, first of all, I think the state has an obligation to give more money to the, to the UCs and the CSUs, frankly. Uh, when you look at what we used to give and what we give today, uh, it's a pittance. Uh, and I, I do believe uh, that we have to respect the Constitution. And part of why you have a UC Regents is because you don't want uh, political interference uh, in the decision making. Uh, so as governor, I'm going to want to balance that, work with uh, the Regents and uh, the UC president, but I think we've got to start by giving more money. Uh, we, we, we focus a lot on what we want and not enough about what we intend to give. Thank you. Mr. Allen. Number one, we fire Janet Napolitano. Number two, we demand accountability from our schools. There is a lot of waste in the CSU and UC systems. I mean, she was stashing $175 million and practically no one even noticed. What we have to do is make sure that we build more of these schools so our kids can get educated. But gone will be these excessive layers of administrators, you know, assistants, and all of these things that are not directly involved in teaching our children. There is so much waste in the UC and CSU systems. We have to cut that out. Secondly, Thank you. we build more. And thirdly, we get someone to run them that is certainly not Jim Paltano. Mr. Cox. These ought to be run like a business. I'm, I'm in the private sector. I don't waste money like they do in government. We have a thousand boards and commissions. That's why we don't have the money to spend on our colleges. They're not being run efficiency, efficiently. Look at the money that's wasted in Caltrans. And let me tell you again, the housing crisis is driving up the cost of government all across every single agency because we've got to pay our employees so much more because the housing is so expensive in this state. What we've got to do is we've got to get the waste and corruption out of Sacramento so that we don't have this monumental cost uh, for education that is that's, basically pricing our kids out of the that's, school. That's 30 seconds, but I'm going to give you five to ten more because I didn't hear how you would address the relationship. With well, I, I think one of the ways to do that is by making getting the politics out of the system. I mean, um, Napolitano and Brown are both politicians. We need to get people in to uh, into these uh, situations that have used, been used to running businesses and that know what it's like to uh, have a payroll and demand <laughs> goals you. and the, to, to demand the, the meeting of those goals. Thank you. Ms. Easton. Ladies and gentlemen, the elephant in the room is that budgets are statements of values. So if you look at the budget of California, when I left to go to UC, 18% went to higher education, 3% went to prisons. Today, less than 12% is going to higher ed and more than 9% is going to prisons. So if you really want to change things in California, you need to take a good look at your values statement when you put the budget together. And yes, the regents do have a lot of power and I'll appoint a lot more regents that look like the people in this room. They won't necessarily come in private jets to their meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question to start with Travis Allen. At what point, if at all, would you stop the over-budget and underfunded bullet train. I would stop it on my first day in office. The bullet train will no longer be, very simply, we are going to stop Jerry Brown's bullet train to nowhere on day one. I will return all of the extra money to California taxpayers. It will never get built. It was a boondoggle from the very beginning. Think about this. If you want to go anywhere in the state of California, you drive or you take Southwest Airlines. It's $59 each way with a two-week <laughs> advance purchase. We do not need Jerry Brown's bullet train to nowhere. It will never be built. In my very first budget, it will be defunded, and all the money will be returned Thank right you. back to you, California taxpayers. Thank you. John Cox. The bullet train is a Exhibit A of the corruption and cronyism that permeates Sacramento. The, the reason it's being built where it's built is because two congressmen traded their vote for Obamacare to make sure it was built in their district. There was a company that built the TGV in France that was going to put it down to five. But, of course, that would not have enriched a whole bunch of lawyers and environmental activists and other people like that because you wouldn't have needed them. That's the problem, ladies and gentlemen, the corruption and cronyism in Sacramento. That's the reason you can't afford your house, your gasoline, your water, and your electricity. And Thank none you. of the politicians up here are going to do anything I'm about not, it. I'm not hearing when you would stop it. Right away, first day. Thank you. Ms. Easton. The concept is an excellent one. Those of you who travel to Europe, to Japan, to China, know that high-speed rail is carbon-free and very good for the environment. The problem is it's like looking your kids in the eye and saying, well, I'm going to buy a new car. We're sorry you can't go to college. 
We have to find a revenue stream to pay for the bullet train if we're going to build it. Maybe it's an oil severance tax. 33 states produce oil. We are among the very top producers, and we're the only one that doesn't have an oil severance tax. If you identify a revenue stream, you can tr think about it. If you don't, you can't afford it until you fix the kids' education. So when would you stop it? At what point? Pardon me? At what point would you cut bait on that project? I would, I would, not, I would keep the project online and as a concept until we can get the revenue to build the project. And that would be, I'll ask the citizens of California, should we do an oil severance tax and should we direct that money into the bullet train? If they say no, we'll stop it. Thank you. Antonio. In my, in my eight years as mayor, I built three light rail lines and one busway more than any city in the United States of America. I didn't do it because we were just moving people. I wanted to uh, leverage economic development. The reason why I've supported and continue to support high-speed rail is because it connects the two engines of the California economy with the one place uh, in the state that has affordable housing and doesn't have a diversified economy. So what do we need to do? We need to, we need to focus on public-private partnerships. We need to look at permitting reform. We need to look at what we do to drive down value engineering, drive down costs. Time's at, up, what when, point, at what point would you stop it? At what point would... I'm not there yet, uh, so I can't tell you what point. Uh, you know, uh, I do support it, and I unequivocally support it because 16 countries have it, uh, and I recognize that we're, nobody here in San Diego, L.A., or anywhere else wants to grow their airports. Thank the you. fact is we have more people. We need a bullet train, but mostly what we need it for is to leverage economic works. development. Next question to start with John Cox. Do you support or oppose repealing the state gas tax increase, and why? I'm the leader of the effort, uh, the constitutional amendment to repeal the gas tax, which will not only repeal the gas tax, but it will make it so that no additional tax can be put in without voter approval. That's very important. This is a regressive, horrible tax because people are moving farther and farther away from work because they can't afford their house, and then the legislature hits them with a gas tax without any reform of Caltrans, which is wasting billions and billions of dollars. It's regressive, it's horrible, it's putting the middle class into the lower class, and it's got to stop, and it's going to end in November. Delaney Easton. To be honest with you, when I was a kid, gas was pretty cheap. It was like 36 cents a gallon, and about a quarter of that was tax. And my relatives came from back east, and they raved about our California freeway system. It was the finest in the world. Since that time, we have been disinvesting in our roads. We've been disinvesting in transportation. And the result is you're spending a lot more time in traffic, and the repairs on the average car is approaching several hundred dollars a year. We need to do something, and this is something that I believe we have to do. It's time for us to pony up for transportation in the state of California. Thank you. Antonio. I support the gas tax. Uh, we hadn't passed a state gas tax in more than 25 years. Uh, we need that money uh, to rebuild our infrastructure. It's a fact that, you know, our roads, our highways, our bridges are in disrepair. Uh, I think we have a D minus uh, when you look at, uh, according to the American Society of uh, Civil Engineers, uh, and we've got to do a better job. Having said that, you know, I think 12 cents for people who have to drive uh, a pickup truck an hour is uh, a lot of money. But, uh, and so in the future, what we need to do is make sure that we have it in a lockbox. Thank you. Travis Allen. 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm the original author of the repeal of the gas tax for a reason. This tax is Jerry Brown's lie. When he was elected in 2010, he said no new taxes without a vote of, without a vote of the people. Not one California citizen that was outside the legislature ever got a chance to vote on it. We will repeal this gas tax in November of this year. 12 cents on regular, 20 cents on diesel, up to $175 in car registrations. Who does this hurt the most? That single mom that leaves out in East County that has to drive back and forth to shuttle her kids back and forth from daycare. This is money off of their table. It is a tax on the poor. Thank you. We will get rid of it on day one. Thank you. Our next question to start with Delane Easton. Legalized recreational marijuana is a massive social experiment in California. What's the one thing that needs to change three months into this social change to make the situation better? I think we need to create a public bank in California that will allow for the uh, deposit of money so that it's safely kept. 
I think we can also use that public bank to do a lot of other good things in the state of California that need to be done. There are small businesses right now that can't get loans to start their business because the big banks want too much money from them. And so it can be a, a, a double benefit to California to have a public bank. I, I wish the bill had been written a little differently. I wish more money had been directed right to mental health. I wish more money had, uh, you know, I wish we'd done it slightly differently. But I, I don't believe in criminalizing marijuana use. Thank you. What's the one thing that needs to change, Antonio? Well, I, I don't think there's just one thing. So I, uh, the single most. Well, I think we need to bank the proceeds, but I got 28 seconds, so I'm going to go on. Um, I also think we need a standard uh, to determine if someone's driving under the influence or operating a jet or a forklift. Uh, I also think uh, that we need to be true to what we said we were going to do. Uh, we were going to focus on local uh, businesses and not, you know, what you see currently happening is a lot of private equity and big uh, moneyed interests are coming in uh, and kind of boxing out Thank the you. Lo local folks. Thank you. Travis Allen. Recreational marijuana will turn out very badly for California. Where it was tried in Col Colorado, they now have the second highest teen usage rate of marijuana in the nation. And crime has not dropped. As a matter of fact, many segments of crime has actually increased, as has the black market in Colorado. The voters of California voted for medical marijuana. And I think a lot of Californians can understand that. If it helps you with your nausea from cancer or your glaucoma or whatever else it happens to be, I think a lot of the voters of California are okay with that. But this legalized recreational marijuana will have disastrous consequences in California, as we've already seen in Colorado. Thank you. So your one thing is you would get rid of it? Yeah, I or think recreational to? marijuana use in California is a very bad idea. Medical marijuana, I think okay. a lot of Californians agree with, but recreational, I think, turns you. out very badly. Uh, I'm, a, I'm against legalization of marijuana. I'm for medical marijuana. But let, let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen, this is all about revenue. They thought they would get a new revenue source. And why? Because they made promises to state workers that they knew when they made them they weren't going to be able to keep. And now they've put your kids a trillion dollars in debt, and they're looking for revenue every place they can. The politicians here are just starved for revenue because they want to spend it on their pet projects and feed their constituencies. Let's do Time. something different for a change and get this state sustainable. So five seconds. The one thing you do to improve it is... I'm sorry. I, I'd like to go to the, port, uh, the Portugal system where they actually put people who use marijuana in hospitals and cure them of their substance abuse. I'm not interested in jailing recreational mar mar uh, marijuana users, and I'm Thank certainly you. for uh, medical marijuana. Thank you. Uh, I think that we just proved that we can't discuss policy issues for California in 30 seconds, but these candidates gave it a pretty good try. I told you that. Thank you very much. I could have told uh, you that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Let's, but, have, let's have a full I will discussion. Say, I agree with that. But these next two questions are built for 30-second responses. Uh, starting with uh, Antonio Villagrosa. So just, they are 30-second responses? These are 30 seconds, but I'm just going to ask you to use one word. Please use just one word to describe Governor Jerry Brown. Prudent. Thank you. Mr. Allen. Failure. Mr. Cox. Panderer. Ms. Easton. Creative. <laughs> wow, wow that's the answer. difference that was pretty good right there <laughs> let's stick with this theme please describe and we're going to start with you Travis President Donald Trump in one word one word incredible <laughs> businessman unhinged A divider. I'm, I'm sorry? It was, the word was, I didn't hear your word. I said a divider. Oh, thank you. Does it serve any purpose um, to define people in one word? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going to use uh, uh, my opportunity to ask one more question in 30 seconds. And this from, comes from Avi Black, the executive director of the California Council for Social Studies and a Berkeley resident. He asks... If not you, who? Which other candidate in the race would you vote for and why? We're going to start with John Cox. 
I'm sorry, they're all politicians, and we need a change from that. And uh, I think this is a creative question, but I'm running because I want to change this state. I'm not running to get another job. I'm not running to elevate my persona. I'm running because this state is being run into the ground by the politicians, and there are all politicians running against me, and we need to make a change because this is a wonderful state, and the politicians are ruining it with taxes, regulations, and the high cost of living. It's got to change, and that's why Time's I'm in this up. race. So you're not going to answer the question, sir? I'm not going to suggest anybody else. Ms. Easton. I'm in the same boat. I'm not suggesting anyone else. I'll be honest with you. I think we have to have this battle. And then when the top two is decided, we'll decide who, who we're going to support. But at the end of the day, we really and truly need to understand that Right now in California, we have too many special interests that are dominating this state. I'm the only candidate running who is not accepting corporate contributions. I'm the one who believes that we should have the people-powered uh, state of California that we once had, and we need to move away from the political uh, problems that we've been developing. Okay. Mr. Villagorosa. Yes, I have respect for anyone who's willing to put their hat in the ring, and um, but... Uh, I have a vote for myself. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I haven't really thought about anyone else. And uh, I agree with Delane. When we get to the top two, I'll, I'll be, and if I'm not in it, I expect to be. But if I wasn't in it, I'd consider it then. Thank you, Mr. Allen. John Cox's answer is not surprising. You see, he's a never Trumper. He's one of those people that calls himself a Republican that didn't even vote for the Republican nominee for president. I am the only Republican in the race that actually supported the Republican nominee for president, Donald Trump, who just created $8 trillion of wealth last year and brought unemployment to its lowest levels for African Americans and Latinos on record. Very simply, John Cox has ran for president, U.S. Senate, Congress, and county clerk recorder and lost every single race. I'll tell you right now who I'm going to vote for. Time. Travis Allen. Time's My name up, will sir. Be on your June Mr. Ballot Cox. And on your November Mr. Ballot, Cox, and I a will rebuttal. be your next governor of the state Thank of California. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Cox, a rebuttal. Uh, need I say more? Exhibit A. Politicians. Uh, this is the reason people don't like politicians, because all they do is attack. All they do is misstate. All they do is lie. All they do is take money from unions and special interests, which is what my opponent has done. And he's also, take, he's also given money to Jerry Brown. I'm surprised he didn't say that he was recommending Jerry Brown for this job. Are you talking about when okay. you voted for no, Jimmy Carter? No, you guys put this the about here. the money you gave to Barbara Boxer and Gavin Newsom. The point, is, the wait, the the point is, ladies and gentlemen, Before this gets off the rails. Politicians, Time's up, Mr. Cox. Time politicians up. are going to and they attack, and that's what they're known for. We're going to move on. Let's do something different. We're going to move on to some substantive questions. I will say, I kind of expected those answers, and they are illustrative of each candidate's approach to the race. Um, for the third round, we're going to start with Michael Smolens. Uh, you have a luxurious 45 seconds again, so okay. really air it out. Um, oh, really air it out. 45 we, seconds, uh, wow. We had uh, solicited questions from educators and others who might be interested in uh, the debate. And uh, this is a question from San Diego High School teacher Rudy De La Torre. Rudy writes, the homeless population in California is exploding, and everyone's solution seems to be to restate that we have a problem. What are the tangible things that you will do to, A, deal with individual homeless people, and B, deal with the environmental hazards left behind from the homeless? Uh, we're going to start this one. Uh, go back to the, the first round. Why don't we start with Delane Easton? The homeless crisis in California is the worst in the nation, probably the worst in the world, or at least among the worst in the first world. I will tell you all we need to declare an immediate emergency as it relates to homelessness in this state. Have you ever seen so many women and children on the streets, so many seniors on the streets? So we must come together and we must do emergency housing for many of our homeless. We must provide mental health scaffolding for those who are having trouble right now. The idea that we just lock them up or throw them in jail is stupid. So we need to, in fact, give them help as other places around the world do. So it needs to be tiny houses. It needs to be vouchers for motels. It needs to be, though, a lot more help for those who may have addictions or other problems, especially when they're women with children. It has to be done urgently. Uh, Delane, if I could follow up on that, uh, how would you fund the emergency housing that you've just described? 
Well, I think, you know, budgets are statements of values, and we have to find a way to, in fact, uh, do this. I think my own long-term, long, uh, one of the things that I think we absolutely must do is we must begin different commercial industrial property tax so that we have a bigger stream of revenue. And the fact is that many companies are paying what they paid in 1978. It was never envisioned that corporations would never be reassessed, but that's what's happened. The Board of Equalization ruled if they don't change hands, and that doesn't mean 50% plus one of the stock. That means the whole company has to change hands. So we have to get more resources into the system by doing that. Now's the perfect time to do it because because of Trump, who I dislike, but who I will say just gave the richest companies in America the biggest tax break in the history of our country. Good time to raise property taxes, don't you think? Thank you. Antonio? Uh, the question was tangible things that we could do and not restate the crisis. Uh, one, uh, support uh, the next the $4 billion bond uh, that will be on the ballot in 2018. Two, you saw the L.A. Times today, uh, spend down the $2 billion that hasn't been spent. Three, uh, more permanent supportive uh, services for the homeless. Um, four, um, the state needs to give back to the cities and counties the billion and a half that we took uh, through redevelopment. So that, uh, and we need to put together a housing trust fund that leverages cities and counties who are putting up their own money. They have to have a plan for workforce, homeless, affordable uh, ha housing, uh, and uh, transit-oriented development, density downtown, permitting reform. It takes too long, costs Thank too much. Thank you, Antonio. Appreciate that. Travis Allen. California has the highest in the nation homelessness rate. We also have the highest in the nation poverty rate thanks to the, fa thanks to the failed policies of Jerry Brown and the California Democrats. In California <laughs> last year, homelessness went up by 13.7%. In Antonio Villaraigosa's city of Los Angeles, it went up by over 23%. There are now 58,000 people sleeping out under bridges and on the sides of roads thanks to the failed policies of the California Democrats. What we must do is we must clean up our streets in San Diego, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco. We must reinstitute statewide institutions. If you are indigent in California, we will provide a roof for your head. We will give you the mental health services that you need, the substance abuse counseling services you need. We will get you back up on your feet, but you will no longer be sleeping in our streets. We have laws against vagrancy, camping, and loitering. We need a governor that will Thank stand up the ACLU clean up our streets, and get our people the help that they need. It's Thank their you, right Assemblyman. as citizens of California, and it's our Thank right you. as Time. citizens of California. Time, sir. Uh, and 30-second rebuttal, Antonio. Yes. Uh, during the mortgage housing meltdown, housing did, uh, homelessness did increase under my watch. Uh, that's why we built 2,500 units of permanent supportive housing uh, in the eight years I was mayor, which is three times more what they did in the 12 years before that. Actually, the number's not 23%, it's 49% increase since I've been gone. Not because I've been gone, but because the state, in the middle of a crisis, took away the tools that cities have needed, uh, the redevelopment money. So uh, I want to bring it back, and I want to put a housing trust fund that Thank leverages you. what cities and counties will do. Thank you. John Cox. As usual, the politicians spend more money and create more government programs. I'm a businessman. Let's solve the problem. Part of the problem is the housing crisis, the cost of housing, get more supply. Part of the problem is we've let out a lot of prisoners because we can't afford to keep them because the politicians have driven up the cost of prison to $75,000 a prisoner. That's why they're reclassifying felonies as misdemeanors. And the other part of the problem is substance abuse. You do people no favors handing out uh, methadone and handing out hypodermic needles and letting them go ahead and live on the street and continue to shoot up. We've got to get treatment centers for these people. We've got to get public-private partnerships with religious groups, possibly, that will help cure the substance abuse and get these people into decent housing and decent jobs. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next question, uh, to begin with Antonio Villagrosa from Lindsay Pinkins. This is touching on affordable housing. Uh, San Francisco Democratic Senator Scott Weiner has introduced a bill to build at greater and higher density near some major transit hubs that reduce local decision making. Do you support that approach? And if not, how would you make housing more affordable for all? Do you support overhauling the state's tough environmental loss? Well, first of all, the Wiener Bill, the problem with it, it only focuses on transit-oriented development. Not everybody has a light rail line. I know that San Diego would like more, uh, and I want to help you get more. Um, so it, it doesn't go far enough on the issue itself. It goes too far in the zoning. I was a mayor. Uh, I don't think any mayor uh, in the state wants the 
you know, the state government, the governor and the legislature to tell them what they need to do with respect to th that specific community. But I do want to incentivize them. Uh, so what I've said is, got 15 seconds, uh, what I've said is, uh, and to answer you before I the 15 seconds is over. Let me answer the question re regarding CEQA. I've been talking about CEQA reform and permitting reform throughout this campaign. I talked about it as mayor. It takes too long to build these things. 17% of all CEQA lawsuits are Thank filed you, Antonio. over housing. Thank you. That's a tough one to answer in 45 seconds. Travis Allen. I absolutely oppose Wiener's bill. The bottom line is this. There are California Democrats that believe that we need urban density. We simply have to build up and put our people in these tiny, compact little beehive cities. What Californians want are more single-family homes. What Californians want is a front yard and a backyard, like the homes that they grew up in. We absolutely must reform CEQA. We have to cut these CEQA lawsuits, cut the fees, cut the regulations. We have to return more power to our local jurisdictions, not take the power away from them. We need to build more housing in California at every single level. In my first four years, I've already pledged to put in place policies where we will build a million more homes <coughs> in California at every single income level. But these are not stack and packs. These are not dense urban centers. These are real homes that Californians want to live Thank in. Thank you, Assemblyman. Single family. Mr. Cox. I'm in the housing industry. I can build apartments for $80,000 a unit in Indiana. It's 500000 here in San Diego. And you know what that cost is? It's impact fees because governments are handing out huge benefits to employees. It's environmental lawsuits. It's CEQA. And, you know, the other politicians here will tell you they'll reform CEQA. Guess what? They're not going to do it. And why? Because environmental lobbyists and extremists control Sacramento. There's no risk-benefit analysis in this. It all is a punny pot for the trial lawyers to sue, and that's got to change. The only way to get more housing is to reduce the regulations. The only way to bring down the cost of housing is more supply. That's what we need, and it's not going to happen with the politicians. We need three million new homes in California. We'll get it with Thank more you. supply. Your position on uh, Senate Bill 827, quickly? Excuse me? Senate Bill 827, support or oppose? I'm, I'm opposed to a one-size-fits-all solution from the uh, Thank state. Thank you. Ms. Easton. I support the general concept of the Wiener Bill. I think it needs some work. It needs to ensure some local, more local control than it's giving right now. And I think uh, the... Um, member is open to doing that. I will tell you, I think one of the biggest things we could do is bring back redevelopment. In Union City, when I was on the city council, we used redevelopment to buy a big, three huge factory lands. We cleaned them of toxics using the redevelopment money, and on those sites we built multi-story, affordable, and market rate housing. Guess what? The people that live there love it because they walk around the corner and get on the BART station, get in the BART station and get on a train. The truth is you can't build everybody a single-family home, and not everybody wants to cut the lawn, but many people can't afford it as their starter home. So let's do this, and let's support the general concept and fix Thank the you. problems. Time, but a quick follow-up. Do you support overhauling CEQA in any fashion? I do support uh, Improving CEQA, it takes too long. Yeah. It needs to be streamlined. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned about environmental quality. Right. Every once in a while, you've got to redo these things, and this is time to redo CEQA, not get rid of environmental quality rules. Thank you. We could have a whole forum on uh, housing and homelessness, uh, but we're going to move on. Uh, our next question is from Chris Reed. <coughs> the California Public Enti Employees Retirement System Board of Directors last year voted to increase the rates that local governments have to pay for their pensions Despite criticism from local officials who say they're already spending 20 percent or more of their budgets on pensions and that they can no longer afford police officers and other social services, given this backdrop, should government pensions be less generous given the problems that local governments have in paying the bills as well as the state government? First question for Travis Allen. CalPERS is in massive trouble. CalPERS is over $300 billion underfunded. Our state employees are being lied to by their union leaders. They are not being told the truth that only 70 cents on the dollar exists to actually pay their benefits. And it gets worse when you talk about their health care benefits, which are entirely unfunded. To compound this problem, the board of CalPERS recently decided to move their assumed investment <coughs> rate of return from 7% to 7.5%. This is a totally fictitious number. What they are doing is padding the books and cooking the numbers and not telling our state employees that there is not enough money in there for them. What we need to do is be transparent with our employees, let them know exactly how bad this problem is and exactly how bad it is going to become. 
And then we have to take solid steps to actually make sure that we can keep the promises that we have made to our California workers Thank you, who signed up for these benefits. Mr. Cox. I've said that uh, <laughs> Bernie Madoff is wondering why Jerry Brown isn't in the next cell to him. Uh, the problem is that we've been lied to, and, and that's the problem. Uh, they've used artificial assumed mm -hmm. rates of return, and they've increased the, uh, the uh, accruals. <laughs> I've met so many police and firemen that have retired at age 55 on 90% of their salaries for the rest of their life. And that's for the rest of their life. In the private sector, they've gotten rid of defined benefit plans. I know, because I've drafted them as a CPA and a lawyer. It's because people are living longer. I refuse to die. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that the system is sustainable, because it's true. The, the ones who are going to get hurt in the long run are the workers. They've been misled by the politicians and the union bosses who have recycled campaign Thank contributions you. in Sacramento. Delaney Easton. There does need to be a thoroughgoing review of public employment and reti retirement. But that doesn't mean we break the faith with those who've retired, that who've went to, through their 30 years on the job and say we're breaking faith with you. What it means, though, is some people that are maybe incoming, we have to review the retirement age. We may have to say you can't have more than one state retirement. We may have to say some, that we're going to convene a task force to take a look at some of the most important changes we can make. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. These are our police officers, our firefighters, our teachers. These are the people that do the sacred work of public service. And yes, we may have to review a few things, but we can't give up and we can't break our faith with those with whom we have a sacred trust. Thank you. Thank you. Antonio. <clears throat> yes. You know, look, I believe that people out who work hard and uh, their entire life ought to retire in dignity. Uh, and I also believe uh, that pensions need to be sustainable uh, going forward. They just do. In the middle of a recession, uh, I, uh, with facing a bankruptcy, I took on that issue. And we took current employees from 6% to 11%, uh, more than any city in the state. Uh, I didn't buy into defined contributions because I think it's a pathway to poverty. Uh, but I do believe that we have to right. make sure that our uh, defined benefits are sustainable, that uh, they're in the black, not the red, that they're not growing so fast and taking such a big part of our budget uh, that, you know, we're not able to pay for the services that our taxpayers expect. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question uh, is for Michael Smolens. I'd like to shift to health care. Um, Single-payer health care sounds pretty good, um, health care, free health care for all. However, it does come with a $400 billion price tag, which is three times the state general fund budget. Um, if you support single-payer, how specifically would you finance it? And if you don't support single-payer, what would you do to help lower the cost of uh, health insurance for individuals? John. The only way you make any good or service affordable and quality is competition. That's the only way to do it. Government can't do that. Price controls have never worked. They've been tried hundreds of times, and they never, ever work. What we've got to do is put the power of health care back in the hands of, of patients and doctors. Take it out of the insurance companies and the government. And you do that with uh, fostering competition, health savings accounts, sales of insurance across state lines. We ought to have hundreds of health insurers to choose from and who are all competing with each other. We will solve the health care crisis in this nation when we have doctors and hospitals advertising their prices and competing with each other. Thank you. Delaney Easton? I support single payer. I've looked around the world at the countries with whom we compete in the first world, the democracies, and they virtually all have the equivalent of single payer. And guess what? They're spending less money than we are. Yet their people are protected. They're saved from the costs that are associated with going bankrupt because you got really sick. They're, they're saved from the child who came into the emergency room and he was unconscious, 107 degrees of fever. The parents were hysterical. The doctor saved the boy's life, but he went deaf in one ear. And it cost you as taxpayers $55,000, all because he didn't get $4 worth of antibiotics. So it's pay me now or pay me later. I say we pay for single health care. We make sure everybody's safe and healthy, and we have to do that as a sacred trust to the people that live here. If, if I could follow up, so how would you finance 
that single well, pair. Uh, there's a great deal of money actually on the table right now. We're already paying public benefits to public employees in the local level, in the county level, in the state level, in our schools, and in, in our retirement system. We have other money, but we could do a gross tax receipt, a gross receipts tax, I should say. And we, there's some other ways that we could close the 30 percent. But in the long run, we're actually going to save money. I had a friend whose sister-in-law got hit by a taxi in Europe, and she was astounded by the Thank level you. of care and the lack Thank you, of Delaine. cost. Antonio. You want to use mine? mine? (laughs) Do we have tech support back there? (laughs) (laughs) Teamwork, you guys. Thank you. This is perfect. Thank you for rolling with it. Uh, Delaney Easton and I agree that uh, that healthcare is a right, not a privilege, and I believe in universal healthcare and have my whole life. Uh, I also support single parent concept. I don't support SB 562, which was the single payer proposal in the legislature. I challenged it because there is a 400 billion dollar price tag. Uh, it would require raising our taxes beyond a, a, a point that you know most people would reject. Uh, what do we need to do uh, to pay for uh, health care? Uh, I'll tell you. We need to focus a lot more on prevention, a lot more on cost containment. We know that the Cleveland Clinic, places like Kaiser, have focused on cost containment and driven down costs. We need to address the fact uh, that uh, our drug formulary is not working. Uh, we need a public option to Thank create you, some Antonio. competition in the system. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll take hers. Let me help you out because there's someone who's conspicuously absent here. Antonio. Who's that? Listen, Mr. Allen. The, the biggest missing person here in the room is Gavin Newsom, the Democrat frontrunner. Gavin's whole platform is single payer in California. If single payer was such a great idea, we would have the v- Veterans Administration running our health care. It will bankrupt California in the first six months. That's why all these Democrats want to raise your taxes because they can't pay for it. It'll bankrupt our state. Think about this. Single payer means you lose your doctor. It means you have to go to the DMV for your medical appointments. It's a terrible idea. It will never happen in California. As your, as your next governor, I will make sure we are never a single payer state. What we do need is to open up our state to out of state insurance companies so they can actually compete for our business. Think about this. More competition means lower premiums. It means higher levels of service. And yes, it actually means we'll get more doctors in California. So you will not only have health care, but doctors that are willing to take that health care. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Lindsay Pena. All right. I guess you, he's not going to come, so we're yeah. going to do that. <laughs> Thank you. You have a substantial chunk of new, unrestricted state money. Prioritize how you would spend it. That spending priority question goes to Delane Easton. I'm sorry, I had a, what was the first part? So you have an unrestricted amount of state money. Prioritize how you would spend it. Well, I would spend it the way the people in this room spend their money. I would put my children first, of course. We would invest in preschool for all. We would invest in K-12 education that would, in fact, take us back to the top 10 of the 50 states in per pupil spending. I would invest, yes, in new colleges and universities, but also making the existing ones tuition-free again. Because at the end of the day, the future of this state and this republic will be about the education that we provide for the next generation of, of Californians. I will also, though, say that I think it's important that we have a conversation about about compassion and about care and about taking care of one another. We have to change the ethic in this state that is a thuggery ethic. We've got to be much more compassionate when it comes to things like criminal justice reform and taking care of business today. Thank you, Delane. Antonio? Yeah, I'm, I agree in large part with what uh, Delane said. If, if we had unlimited money and we don't, uh, and we always have to have accountability in how we spend that money. But look, th- the number one issue facing this state is, is education. Uh, if we want to grow our economy and grow middle class jobs, which is which my candidacy is all about, we're going to start. We have to start educating people, and that means early child education. It means prenatal care. It means uh, universal preschool and uh, full day kindergarten. It means bringing back the arts uh, into uh, our classrooms. It means paying our teachers more. It, it does mean, uh, I do believe uh, that the goal ought to be 
that, you know, CSUs and UCs should be free. Uh, and if you had unlimited money, uh, I would do that. Thank you. Uh, Travis Allen. You know, um, unlike what Jerry Brown and the California Democrats believe, there is no such thing as unlimited tax revenue in the state of California. This is why 243,000 Californians have left on balance in the last seven years, taking $8 billion with them. Number one, our first priority, my first priority as your next governor of the state of California, is to cut taxes, to put as much money back into California taxpayers' pockets as is humanly possible. Past that, what we need to do very simply is we need to fix our roads and expand our freeways with no new tax dollars. We must complete the California State Water Project so we can actually <laughs> store our water when it rains up and down the state of California by building new water storage. And then, very simply, we need to build more schools in California across the board, but especially in our higher education institutions. California citizens deserve the Thank very you, best. Thank you, Assemblyman. We used to be the greatest John state, Cox. and we will be again. This state doesn't have a, a revenue problem. It has a spending problem. The budget has gone up from $80 billion to $140 billion. And guess what else has gone up? The waste and inefficiency. It needs a business approach to make sure that we get what we're paying for. We've got tons of money for infrastructure, for roads. It's being squandered. And I'll tell you why. It's because the special interests control these politicians and control the whole debate in Sacramento. What we've got to do is we've got to get the special interests out of power. We've got to start using our resources. We need infrastructure. We need to pay down our pension debt. We need to start planning an economy for the 21st century and getting growth. And it's not going to happen with the politicians just putting more controls and more spending on, on the backs of the taxpayers in this state. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next question by Chris Reed. A year ago, Matt and I had a telephone interview with Governor Jerry Brown in which he expressed disbelief, amazement, that so many times state lawmakers would propose expensive new programs without ever considering how to pay for them. What is the most underfunded government need in California, and how specifically would you find money to pay for it? Antonio, that, for, that question's to you. Well, I think education is the most underfunded need if I had to just pick one housing's right after that but um, how would we pay for it I think we got to grow our economy and we've got to grow more middle-class jobs so that we're bringing in more revenue I do think as I said earlier uh, that we we can't be afraid of setting high standards and having more accountability in our education system we want to get more with the money we got uh, but uh, for, if there was one thing that I would say is the most underfunded uh, it's education we are 42nd by one measure, 46 by another measure in per pupil spending. Uh, when we had the best schools in the United States of America, we were in the top 10 in per pupil spending. Money does count. Do you have a specific revenue stream for that? I don't have a specific uh, revenue stream right now. I do believe uh, that we've got to grow our economy. Uh, that's why I've talked about improving our business climate, growing that economy, growing more middle class jobs so we can have more money in the budget. Thank you. Assemblyman. When Jerry Brown became governor in 2010, the California State General Fund was $86 billion. Today, it stands at over $131 billion. That's an increase of over $45 billion of your tax dollars, or over 50%. California brings in more tax revenue than it ever has in our history. And where has that left us? With the spending of Jerry Brown and the California Democrats, our pension systems and our unfunded health care liability are underwater well over $300 billion. Stanford University says it's closer to a trillion dollars. And yet our roads are crumbling and our water infrastructure is failing. Very simply put, we don't need to raise any new additional tax in California. We need to cut tax in California. Then we must reprioritize our spending. We have to fix our roads. We have to expand our freeways. We must complete the California State Water Project. And we must make Thank sure you. that pensions are solved in California. Do you have a specific way to pay for infrastructure and roads? Do you have a specific way to pay for infrastructure and roads? Existing revenue. Uh, Republicans in the California legislature came up two years ago with a plan that would have saved $7 billion from our existing taxes that we are already collecting with no new taxes to fix our roads and expand our freeways. Instead, the Democrats put on a $52 billion tax where less than 35% will ever see its way into our roads, and not $1 of that money will be spent on any new free freeway lanes anywhere in the state. Thank you. Mr. Cox? This, this state is not underfunded. I took over a snack food company in, in Chicago that was losing $17 million a year on $100 million in sales. And why? Because they were wasting money hand over fist. 
We turned it around. We assembled a team. We went from a $17 million loss to a $3 million profit in one year, and we saved 600 jobs. That's the job we need to have done in, in California because this government is being run by the corrupt and the cronies. I'm the only one talking about turning it around. We need a lot of investments. We need to make sure we use our money wisely because it is a disservice to the people of this state to keep the politicians in power and the cronies in power in Sacramento wasting our money and putting our children in debt. That ends in 2018. Thank you. Delane? Well, let me just say, the real cut in resources to schools in this state came because of Prop 13. The intention was that, in fact, we would give homeowners a big break by cutting Prop 13. Over, at that time, homeowners were paying just over half of the property taxes. Since that time, homeowners are now paying 72% of the property taxes. The people that have saved all the money are commercial and industrial property owners, and that money, half of it, should have gone into our schools. And if we make that one change in Prop 13, and we redirect those, we go to the voters, we ask them for it, but we redirect that money to our schools, and then we reassess commercial and prop industrial property every 10 years, we will see a rebirth of our schools and the educational system that was the glory of California. Thank you. Uh, for our last series of questions, we're going to draw from uh, the questions that the public submitted to us. Uh, Michael, why don't you take the first one from San Diego resident Jake Zindolk. Um, yes, it's from Jake Zindolk. Please discuss a time when one of your policies or programs failed, including what you did in response and what you learned. Travis, we'll start with you. So, as you all know, I am the uh, original author of the California gas tax repeal, to repeal Jerry Brown's gas tax. I have the largest social media following of any politician in the entire state, of anybody in California. With more traffic, anyone seeing it, join TravisAllen.com. You may have seen my videos there. Find me and, and realize that I was the guy that was speaking against this. I spoke against it on the assembly floor. I wrote op-eds against it. I did everything we could to stop this $52 billion tax. Unfortunately, Jerry Brown bribed four legislators over a billion dollars to pass it. We put everything we could into fighting it on the legislative floor, and yet it still passed. This is because the people of California have been failed by Jerry Brown and the policies of the California Democrats. That is why I was original author of the gas tax repeal, to put that in the back of the hands of the California people. And that's how we solve the problem, by repealing it in November. Which we will. John. You know, it's been stated that I ran for office before in deep blue Illinois, and it's true, because Illinois, just like California, is owned by the funders of the campaigns. I mean, they dictate what goes on, the big union bosses and the big businesses. Uh, I moved to California 10 years ago following my mother, who retired to Fresno, and I discovered that California has ballot initiatives. You can change the way your legislature is elected. You can get the cronies out of power. You can take the corrupt out of power and get the government back in the hands of the people and into people that are, care about the community and don't care about making money for themselves. We deserve better leadership. I'm the only one of the governor candidates who's talking about real reform and putting the government back in the hands of the people. I didn't hear one of your policies or programs that failed. Do you I, I, it was a policy to run for office in Illinois against the cronies, <laughs> and it was difficult. Delaney Easton. Well, when I got to the legislature, <clears throat> I asked to see the long-range plans. I had been on a city council. We were required to have a long-range plan. The counties are required to have them. I worked for a big company. We, I was on strategic planning. So I knew they had a big plan for 20 years. So I asked to see the long-range plan, and everybody said, oh, my God, we don't have long-range plans. Oh, water, parks, and wildlife said, yeah, we do. We have a, a water plan. It was done under Governor Brown, Pat Brown, 1957. So I carried a bill to do a long-range water plan. Pete Wilson called me a communist. I said, no, actually most capitalist companies have water plans, but so do socialist countries. The reality is that planning is something anybody with a brain in their head does. It was that bill was vetoed by Governor Wilson. Thank you. Antonio. I don't know if I have a policy, but uh, I could tell you there's a difference between me today and there was... Uh, when I was a legislator. When I was a legislator, I tried to expand Medi-Cal to 200% above poverty. 
um, for two years in a row. It was at 100%. I couldn't get a vote because I didn't have a funding plan. Uh, a year later, I got a healthy family. 750,000 kids got health care. I learned as mayor uh, that, you know, once you have to sign a check on the front, uh, that you care about spiraling health care costs, that you care about workers' comp, that you care about... Uh, you know, lawsuits and the like. And so I think the, if I, not so much a policy, but over the years, you know, you've come to realize when you're the governor, you're the mayor, the chief executive, the buck stops with you and you've got to make the tough calls. Thank you. Uh, our next question from Lindsay uh, is from Oceanside resident Jim McDonough. All right, Jim asks, what do you plan to do to make California's taxation systems fairer and less volatile? John, we'll start with you. We need to reduce taxes at all levels. You look at Texas and Florida. These are two states that exist without an income tax. How do they survive? And, you know, Florida has retirees and tourism. We have more retirees and tourism than Florida. We have more agriculture. We have more dairy and cattle than uh, Texas. We have more oil reserves than Texas. What we don't have is good, honest political management. That's what we need. We need people in government who have had experience in the private sector solving problems. The politicians are great at attacking and making a lot of angry noises, but they aren't good at solving problems and putting the right practices in place to get services delivered efficiently. Thank you. That's what has to change. Elaine Easton? As, as I've said before, I would fundamentally change Prop 13 as it relates to commercial industrial properties. Right now, the system is, it, it, it looks like we've had this huge tax increase at the state level, partly because local taxes are so much lower in terms of property than they are in other states like New York, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. And so one of the things we can and should be doing is having a conversation about how we address that. In the city of Richmond, for example, there's a huge Chevron factory. In the years since the passage of Prop 13, their property taxes are basically the way they were in 1978. But guess what? It costs the schools of Richmond $100 million. That's stunning. That's a gut punch. So we need to bring back property taxes that will, in fact, support our schools and the education of children. Thank you. Yes, I think we need to fix the whole broken tax system. Two uh, bipartisan uh, commissions have looked at it, Think Long and California Forward. And well, as we all know, uh, as an example, the upper, upper income tax, which is the highest in the country and now worse because of uh, the Trump tax plan, which doesn't allow you to deduct uh, the d mortgage uh, deduction in the way that you did or lo state and local taxes, um, is broken because a 3 percent cut in capital gains and the way that we uh, tax capital gains is a 20 percent impact on the budget. We're one of, uh, I think, 30 states have a service tax and we're one, the fastest growing part of the California economy is service. And then finally, as uh, uh, Delena said so well, Prop 13 is broken. Uh, I thought the number was 60-40, but what we know, it's, it's inverse. 72. Thank yeah, you. It's inverse from what it was. Tax, you know, homeowners used to pay less a corporate let, a more, now it's the other way around. Thank you. Travis Allen. We have to cut taxes in California. I have a five-point plan to fix California. The very first is to cut taxes. It starts with a repeal of the gas tax on day one, and then we have to go to all of the other taxes. Californians pay the highest in the nation income tax. They pay the highest in the nation sales tax. We also pay among the highest gas taxes and highest corporate taxes in the entire country. We have to protect Prop 13, all aspects of Prop 13, we must cut our tax in California. We saw what happened nationwide when Trump cut taxes. Eight trillion dollars of wealth created, unemployment down to levels we've not seen since 2000. We have to bring that economic miracle to California. It starts by cutting taxes in California. Thank you. Uh, and then the last question uh, will come from Chris Reed for, uh, via San Diego resident Jeff Patnow. Jeff's question is more predicated uh, that it's aimed at Democrats rather than Republicans, so the Republican candidates can choose to respond however they want. Here's Jeff's question. With a predicted economic slowdown on the horizon, as governor, will you be able to say no to the legislators of your party who continue to seek new programs or spending increases in Sacramento that might wipe out the fiscal discipline of the last eight years? Question mark. What assurances can you share with voters that you will not lead California down a path of fiscal irresponsibility? Delane, no, I'll take, first I'll question. Take that on. Let's, uh, Delane, let's have Delane answer it. 
Well, let me just say to all of you, the state constitution says we're supposed to balance the budget every year. That's in the constitution. And so what I commit to you is to, in fact, plan ahead so that we can balance the budget of the state of California every year. But that may mean making some changes. You know, it's, it's true. We do not tax. If you go and buy a suit at Nordstrom's, you pay a full tax on the full suit. If you hire a tailor to make the suit, you only pay tax on the, on the material. And the tailor suit probably cost five times what the suit at Nordstrom's did. So there's some service taxes that we can look at that will, in fact, help us to stabilize and make it more equal and even. Having said that, in the long run, the state of California is on a better path if we do make the other changes that I've recommended. And 45 seconds isn't very long to address that question. Thank you. Now your turn, Mayor. Yes. Uh, I, you, when you asked me to describe one, with one word uh, Jerry Brown, I said prudent. He took us from historic uh, deficits to historic surpluses, and I have a lot of respect for him for that. Uh, I was mayor in uh, the toughest economic time since the 1930s. I had a billion, uh, $1.2 billion structural deficit with a $4.5 billion city budget. I had to make the tough calls, uh, and as governor, I will make the tough calls. Uh, if you notice virtually every question uh, that you said, uh, you know, I said, you know, we've got to do this in a way that's fiscally prudent. We've got to protect the, the taxpayer dollars. We've got to make sure uh, that when we have want a program, that we're going to fund that program, that we have a revenue source, that we have accountability, that it's getting spent Thank you. wisely. Travis Allen. Every single Democrat on the stage, including Gavin Newsom, who doesn't think enough of San Diego to actually even show up to this debate, believe in raising your taxes and saddling future generations with more bond debt. In 2012, when I was elected to the California State Legislature, I signed a no new tax pledge, which said I would never raise tax on Californians because they're already among the highest in the nation. I have a 100% vote record on that from the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and the California Taxpayers Association. Unlike my so-called Republican rival, who believes in raising sales taxes to over 23% in California, I believe taxes are high enough and they must be cut in California. The bottom line is this. These are not just words. We need action. We need a governor who will veto the California legislature and bring tax cuts directly to the California people through special Thank ballot Thank you, Assemblyman. Mr. Cox. My opponent distinguishes himself as a politician, as uh, tell, not telling the truth, and, and you can go look that up. But the temporary leader here, Mr. Newsom, uh, is, uh, is a danger to the future of this state. Jerry Brown is often called the adult in the room in Sacramento. Well, Mr. Newsom is a teenager with a bottle of whiskey and the car keys. Because this state will be a disaster with any of the Democrats, and especially Gavin Newsom. And why? Because it's the corrupt and the cronies that run wild in Sacramento. You may not know this, there are 5,000 bills that are introduced every legislative session in Sacramento. Do you think this state needs 5,000 new pieces of legislation and new taxes? No, it's because the corrupt and the cronies and the special interests sponsor those, and these politicians Thank you. dance to their tune. Thank That's going to change in 2018. The, uh, that takes care of all our questions. We are going to close with closing statements. Uh, and Mr. Villagorosa, why don't you go first, and then we'll start with Travis Allen, John Cox, and Delaney Easton. Closing statements, you have 60 seconds. First of all, I, I want to thank you all for... Uh, waking up on a Sunday morning and coming here to hear uh, the four of us uh, in this debate. Uh, and I'm hoping that you're here uh, be, and because you understand that this election is important. Uh, and to the people who in Los Angeles and Fresno and San Francisco who can't be with us, I just want to thank you as well for checking in. I think it is important to show up. I've showed up to every single debate. I think there have been 17 now. I've gone to every town up and down this state, and I have because I respect you, because I understand this election is not about me. It's about you. It's about the high cost of living. It's about the fact that people are working hard every single day, checking all the boxes, and they're not making it in the way that they uh, want to and need to. We've got to address a broken housing uh, crisis, which is the biggest reason why we have the highest effective poverty rate in the United States of America. Uh, as governor of California, I'll take on those issues. I'll work with you, listen to you, show up in San Diego and Thank every you, part Antonio. of the state to address the challenges that we face in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Allen. My name is Travis Allen. I was born and raised right here in California. I lived here my entire life, but I've had to watch as my family has left the state. My best friend now lives in Texas, where he doubled the size of his house 
double the size of his business, and pays no state income tax. I am a business owner. I manage money for a living. My clients all start out here in California. They now live in 22 states around the nation. California used to be the greatest state in the country, but due to 39 out of the last 40 years of the California Democrats running the legislature, it has been run into the ground. 24 of the last 50 years, Jerry Brown and his family have run California into the ground. I have a very simple five-point plan to take back California. Number one, we will cut your taxes, starting with the repeal of the gas tax on day one. Number two, we'll get tough on crime. Repeal AB 109, Prop 57, Prop 47. Number three, we will fix our roads and expand our freeways with no new taxpayer dollars. Number four, we will fix our broken education system. And number five, we will complete the California State Water Project. In my first 100 days, we will reverse the illegal sanctuary state. And when I'm your governor, we'll have voter ID Thank you. in California. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Cox. There are 19 states around the country of elected Republican businessmen as governors, even blue states like Maryland and Massachusetts. And they're the most popular governors in the nation. And you know why? Because they solve problems. I have a positive vision for this state. I love this state. We can have great roads, great education, a great water project, but we need to make some changes and we need to get the corrupt special interests and the cronies out of power. I'm offering a positive solution to this state. This state has been led into the ditch by the politicians and the corrupt special interests they fund. And that's a problem. I want this state to be where my daughter grows up and has a wonderful future. I want that for all of our children. We're not going to do that as long as our government is controlled by the cronies and the corrupt who run it for their own purpose. Let's get a great state that we can be proud of. Let's get a legislature that we can be proud of. This current legislature ranks right below colonoscopies and cockroaches. Let's change the system Thank you, and we'll Cox. get a government we can be proud of. Thank you. Delaney Easton. My dad used to like to say Californians are people born somewhere else who came to their senses. <laughs> I'm a fifth generation Californian on my mom's side and I love this state. And I will just tell you it needs a little bit of work right now. First, I want to tell you all something I haven't said yet. I believe in something called science. So I'm actually the best environmental candidate to run for this office, and I will fight to ban the fricking fracking, and I was the first candidate to call for that. Second, I will fight for health care for all. Third, I will be absolutely vigilant in terms of our support for education in the state of California. And I have to tell each and every one of you that the truth is I did so much better in life because I got a wonderful education. I want that for every kid. And we have to keep a sacred trust to those who went before us and built the system that we have. I will also say that I believe in housing and homelessness is the solution to homelessness is housing, and we have to have a full court press to do that. It means we've got to get some electricians and plumbers, Thank carpenters you, going. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, that, that concludes our event. And so now, I just want to say a few brief things, and then you can clap as loud as you want. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the journalists who joined me on stage, the candidates who cared to come here today, and especially you all. Like, your work is just starting. You need to do some more research, and importantly, get out there and vote on June 5th and again in November. Thank you, guys.